The song I heard that um, Miss Kanaheli is singing it yesterday at the park yesterday. Hello, it's called Ho'omana. It's a favorite song among Hawaiians, especially the, from Nihau. And the first line says, Helu Ekahi, number one. Ku Ho'omana, number one, strength, strength. And it says, Maka Honua Neo Puni, it comes from all over the earth. Okay. And so this is talking about Yesu Christo. It also mentions about Nihau, the island of Kahele Lani, you hear that. And Ho'omana, Ho'omana, magnify his strength. You say it twice, so you magnify his strength. And it, and it says, Ho'omana, strength, Ia Yesu Kealii, Jesus Christ the King. Now you can all hear me. So I just said you can take off your face mask now if you'd like to do so. And we do ask everyone to remain in their seats for the entire service. However, if you must get up, please put your face mask back on, fully covering your nose and mouth. And then uh, if you're going to be walking within six feet of anyone, please give them the chance to do the same. Well, welcome and aloha to each and every one of you today. I'm Alan Akana, the kahu or pastor of the church, and it's so good to have everyone with us. We had an awesome parade yesterday. Koloa Plantation Days Parade, of course, goes right in front of our church, and we had a great contingency with our decorated floats and our banner, and we had people of all ages walking and sitting in golf carts, and it was just fun being a part of our local community. So thank you to everyone that helped decorate and those who participated and those who took all the decorations down after the parade. And thank you, Penny Osuga especially, she's right over there by the door, for just kind of organizing and coordinating everything. It just was a, a wonderful day. 
I also wanted to say that after two and a half years of the pandemic, we started having our monthly church breakfast again, and this time it was at Keave Roots um, up in Lawai, and it was just great gathering church people together and sitting down and enjoying each other's company in a small and safe environment, and, and I hope when we do it again that um, the rest of you that um, may not have come to breakfast before will come and just check it out. It's um, definitely first come, first serve, um, and you have to sign up ahead of time uh, because we have to give reservations to the restaurant. But it's just a really fun thing we do monthly. And I did want to mention if we have any guests that are visiting for the very first time, welcome. And also be sure to get your visitor packet. There's a gift from the church in there for you and also information about the church and a visitor card or you can tell us some information about yourself, and we always appreciate that. One of the things that we don't do during the pandemic is pass around the offering bowl, and if you've been especially blessed by our time together, you may um, leave a gift for the church here at the communion table after the service, and we also have an offering basket right outside the main doors over here in this area. Okay, I think we just have a couple other announcements I need to make. Prayers and Squares is meeting on Tuesday for their monthly quilt tying. And for those of you that don't know about uh, Prayers and Squares, they make beautiful quilts. And there's an, a sample out there um, on the patio area um, outside the main doors. And uh, one of the things that they uh, just want to make sure everybody knows, you can be an expert quilter and know all about quilts and all about sewing. Or on the other end of the spectrum, you may not know anything at all about sewing or quilting, and they always need help from people of all different levels of ability. So if you'd like to know more, just see one of the ladies uh, who are involved in Prayers and Squares. And I just want to tell you, every time somebody receives one of these beautiful prayer quilts from our church, they typically call me or text me or send me a note right away telling me just how meaningful it is not only knowing that the church is praying for them, but having a beautiful physical reminder that we're praying for them regularly. Um, also, um, Ho'okipa, uh, for those of you that want to participate in our stretching class afterwards, Rose Tatiana will be leading that class right over here in Moore Hall, just a few minutes at the end of the service. So today's theme is clothed with Christ. And I would like to invite you to think about something just before we begin the service. Imagine when people, when they look at you, just as they see what you're wearing, they would immediately see Christ as well. I'm just going to let you sit with that for a moment and think about what it might take for you so that you would be assured when people look at you, they will see Christ. Today's call to worship is adapted from Psalm. 107. Is it okay? Okay. <clears throat> Come, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, and the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Have you been wandering in a, wandering in a spiritual wilderness? The Lord will gather from far and near all who wander and redeem them with grace and mercy. Do you hunger and thirst for fulfilling relationships and meaningful community? The Lord will satisfy the desires of your heart. Are you tired and feeling faint from all the challenges that life sends your way? The Lord will deliver you from all your troubles and give you the strength to carry on. Are you anxious because of the many twists and turns in your life? The Lord will make the crooked path straight and lead you to a place of joy. Have you been sitting in darkness and gloom? The Lord will bring you into the light and break all of your chains. Is your spirit dry and parched? The Lord turns the desert into pools of fresh water, and the Lord will turn our souls into healing springs. Let us give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love and for all the gifts we enjoy. Let us offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. Let us sing songs of joy. Let us pray. O oh God, we are grateful for all of the ways you show up in our lives. We rejoice that you are always present in love. As we gather together to worship you, may our hearts be open to receive your grace and mercy. 
May our minds be open to receive your wisdom. May our hands be open to receive all of the gifts that you now offer us. Amen. <clears throat> Today's Old Testament reading is from Psalm 107, verses 1 and 35 to 43. Listen for the word of God. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. The Lord turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. And there the Lord lets the hungry live. They establish a town to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By the Lord's blessing, they multiply greatly, and the Lord does not let their livestock decrease. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, trouble, and sorrow, the Lord pours contempt on princes and makes them wander into trackless wastes. But the Lord raises up the needy out of distress and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all the wickedness stops its mouth. Let those who are wise pay attention to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. The new, today's New Testament reading is from the letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Listen for the word of God. <clears throat> so if you had been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways that you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, enslaved, and free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Today's gospel reading is from Luke, chapter 12, verses 22 through 31. Listen for the word of God. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They neither have storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. 
Oh, how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your span of life? And if then you are not able to do so, small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow, is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep seeking what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying, for it is the nations of the world that seek all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. May God bless the reading of the word, and may our hearts be open to receiving it. Good morning, everyone. You might recognize this song. This is 
Thank you so much, Chris and Michelle. I love that song. Well, every once in a while, I hear politicians and religious leaders say some of the craziest things. I'm probably the only one, right? So just the other day, I was listening, and you know, somebody quoted a Bible verse. And I thought, so you can say pretty much anything you want about politics, about ethics, about anything. And as long as you have a Bible verse to go with you to back you up, whatever you say is authoritative. And I just remember way back when I started seminary, almost 40 years ago, I learned that this process of using the Bible to find text that will prove anything that you want to say is called proof texting. And basically, what people are used to doing and have always been used to doing is approaching the Bible with their preconceived set political agenda or whatever their ethical standards are, and they look for pieces throughout the Bible and they grab them from wherever, usually out of context, to say, see, I'm right. And sometimes some of these people will actually hold the Bible up so that when you look at them, you have no uh, idea that you can even say anything against them because they've got the Bible to back them up. Well, as I started seminary, one of the things that I was taught very early on is that you can literally take any piece of the Bible, or, or you, can, you can take any philosophy, any ideology, any belief, and find a word or two or a phrase or a sentence in the Bible to back you up, especially if you don't care about context. So what I learned in seminary was rather than coming to the scriptures with our ideas about what's important to us, we should just come saying what was important to God and what continues to be important to God, what was important to Jesus and what continues being important to Jesus, what was important to the community of faith at that time, and what continues to be important to communities of faith like ours. And rather than looking for verses to back up what you already believe, be open enough to say there might actually be something in the Bible that could possibly change my mind about something. Go figure that one. So anyway, as you've probably heard me say before, when, when I am looking at a particular text in the Bible, whether it's Old Testament, Old Testament or New Testament, I, I, I put that in the context of all of the scripture. Like I think of the entire Bible. That's what I was taught to do in seminary, not just take little pieces from here and there, but, but say in the context of the entire Bible, what do, what do these few words mean? And then also, in the context of that particular book and the message of that book in the Bible, what do these particular few words mean? And then on top of that, learning as much as we can about the culture, the church at the time, the author, what was going on in society so that we can figure out what the intent was there so that we can take the intent and apply it to where we are today in the 21st century. Of course, when I was in seminary, it was the 20th century, and that sounds like a long time ago, but I guess it was. So anyway, today we're looking at Colossians 3. And if we just start reading Colossians 3 without looking at anything else, we will get a very warped idea, I believe, of what the author was trying to get across. In fact, I think it's the opposite idea. And I can't tell you how many sermons I've been to and politicians I've listened to and others that use some of Colossians 3 for their agenda. And I believe that because they're taking it out of context, they're saying the opposite of the intent. So let's take a look, first of all, at what Colossians 1 and 2 is all about. So during the month of July, we've been looking over Colossians 1 and 2. And I would say that the most important theme for me to interpret the rest, and certainly one of the major themes in Colossians and throughout the whole New Testament, is that in Christ, the entire fullness of God dwells. 
and we have the fullness of Christ with us. That was a response to what was going on at the time in terms of the Gnostic leaders. Gnosticism, as I've explained over the last couple weeks, was this idea that comes right out of Greek philosophy, where these leaders went back to Plato, who basically had a very dualistic idea of the world, of reality, of truth. And according to Plato, on the one hand, you have reality, which are forms, and on the other hand, you have not really reality, or maybe just a shadow of the reality, which are the particulars. So let me explain that a little better. The form would be humanity and love, the idea of humanity and love. That's the form. Plato would say that's very real. But the two of you being in love, two human beings, any two of you or any three, whatever, th that's just a shadow. It's not real. The same thing with wetness. The idea of wetness is real. But actually, having water Turning on a faucet, having water drip on your hands and feeling that actual water, that's just a shadow of the reality. And so Plato and everyone after him, all the Greek philosophers, had this very dualistic idea of reality. So the Gnostics at the time that Colossians was being written was basically spiritualizing all of that. And they were saying everything spiritual is real. Everything material is not real. In fact, they would go so far as to say everything spiritual is good and everything material is bad. And so they had all these rules about sexuality and about dietary, they had many dietary restrictions. Some of them injured themselves on their skin. Some of them abstained from certain pleasures in terms of eating and whatever. But there was this idea that they taught and, they, and this teaching started creeping into the church. Everything heavenly, everything spiritual is perfect and good, and everything earthly, including the earth, is bad, and frankly, not even real. So they went on to say that because Jesus had a physical body, he could not possibly contain any more of God except just a little spark of this divine fire. So this teaching was creeping into the church at the end of the first century when Colossians was being written. And most scholars think it was probably written about the year 80, so about half a century after Jesus died and was resurrected. But here we've got this idea spreading throughout the church that everything spiritual is good, everything material is actually bad and evil, and because Jesus had a body, he could not be fully good. He could not have fully God in him. And so, as a response to that, the writer of the letter of Colossians said, in Jesus, the fullness of God, the, or the fullness of deity, actually dwells. And so in Colossians 1 and 2, which we've spent the last few weeks looking at, we've come up with this really clear picture from the author that's writing to the followers of Jesus in the area of Colossae that, you know what? Jesus had the fullness of God within him. We, being with Jesus, even after he died, we have access to the fullness of God. And, and, and it's based on this idea that goes all the way back to the first creation story in Genesis where God created everything material and said, it is good and it is very good. So now we get to Colossians chapter 3, which is often misinterpreted, I believe, like crazy. And the opening verses say, Seek that which is above. Set your mind on that which is the things that are above, not on the things that are earthly. And so many people, including people today, will say, ha ha, see, the Gnostics were right. Everything spiritual is good. We should always focus on the spiritual. Everything earthly is bad, everything material. And um, frankly, if the author of Colossians meant that, 
he would not have spent two entire chapters explaining how the opposite had to be true. Got that? Now, when I look at people saying things that hurt the earth, some of what's going on in there is this thing in their mind that says, it doesn't really matter because the earth isn't that real anyway. It's not spiritual. When I see people hurting other people sometimes, or even their own bodies, it's kind of like, it, that doesn't matter. As long as I'm pure, pure spiritually with God, that's what God wants. And the letter to the Colossians in chapter 3 is actually saying, nope, that's not it at all. Actually, chapters 1 and 2, making it really clear. What that author is basically saying here now, in chapter 3, but being based on chapter 1 and 2, we have within us the fullness of God. Because Christ had the fullness of God and Christ is in us. And we simply cannot look at our bodies or the earth or any part of the earth as bad or evil or unreal. But it's interesting how all of a sudden in chapter 3, it seems like the author is almost switching gears and agreeing with the Gnostics and saying, oh, you know, there are you know, we're supposed to set our mind, you know, seek the things that are heavenly and set our minds on that which is above, not the earthly things. But actually, if you read into it, all that you've learned in chapter one and two, I think what the author is doing here is saying, okay, you want to play the game of dualism, going all the way back to Plato, I can play that game too. Let's talk about that which is good and that which is bad. And basically, what the author of Colossians is saying is, the earth that was created by God and all of its inhabitants are good and of ultimate value to God. So if we're going to separate good and bad, that's the good. The bad is anything that harms the earth or any of its inhabitants, including any other human being, any one of them. So the author here is basically saying, Okay, what the Gnostics are coming up with, wrong. That goes against everything that we've been taught as Jewish people and as Christians. So what do we have? If we're going to have some kind of dualism, we have to say, what is good? All that God has created, including our bodies, including everyone else, and everything on the earth. And what is bad? If you're going to have some kind of dualism, anything that hurts, anything that God has created, and any one that God has created. Seems pretty simple. But yet, as we look at history, and not just the history of the world and politics, but the history of the church as well, we have a hard time fully embracing this idea that the fullness of God continues to be in Christ, and Christ continues to be in us. So the author to the letter of Colossians wants to make it really clear and gets into detail in terms of the dualism that he's promoting, the good and the bad. And I actually wrote down the things that he wrote that we should stay away from. And I did my best as I looked at all these words and looked at the scriptures and looked at dictionaries and came up with just a, a brief description or definition for each of these. But the idea is, the author says, not only should you look at all that's good, but fully embrace it. Put it on as if it's your clothing. But first, you've got to strip yourself of all the clothing that you don't want to have anything to do with. And here are those things. And of course, starts out with sexual immorality, which I think is often very uh, misinterpreted. And I wrote down the description of that is, anything which we would interpret as sexual acts or attitudes which hurt people in any way. Next, impurity. Those things that cause you to take the focus off of God. And as I was thinking of this, I thought of Soren Kierkegaard's quote, um, of course, the famous Danish philosopher and theo theologian, purity of heart is to will one thing, which he called the good or God. And his idea is 
fully devote yourselves to God, and anything that gets in the way of that, strip it off. Get rid of it. Next, passion, referring here to being passionate about things that cause you to take your focus off of God. It's not passion in general. There are some things we should be passionate about, like helping other people, like loving other people, like justice. Passion itself, of course, is not bad. It's what you're passionate about. Evil desire, desires which cause harm rather than desires that lead to peace and desires that come from a place of compassion. Greed, wanting more than you need at the expense of the earth or her inhabitants. Anger, the kind of rage that leads to hurting others. Wrath, rage in action. Malice, the intention to hurt or inflict pain on another. Slander, language that inflicts pain on another. And abusive language, when a person with power repeatedly uses language which inflicts pain on another. I think you're getting the idea here that if you are hurting someone in any way with your actions, with your thoughts, with your attitudes, with your speech, then those are the things you need to strip yourself from. Take it off, throw it away, leave that stuff behind. And then the author says, now that you've gotten rid of those things, here are the things you need to put on in their place. Put on compassion. Put on kindness. Put on patience, put on forgiveness, put on humility, put on gentleness or meekness. It's this idea, as I said at the beginning of the service, when somebody looks at you, what would you like them to see? Embrace those kinds of things so much that they become something that people actually see when they look at you. So the author of Colossians is really saying, OK, dualism. Everybody seems to be a dualist these days, so we'll, I'll be a dualist along with you. Everything on the earth and every inhabitant and the earth itself, that's good. And everything that harms, that's bad. And then the author takes it to the next level and talks about resurrection language. We've been risen with Christ. And it goes on to say also that there is no difference between people, Jew, Gentile, barbarian, Scythian, enslaved or free. We are all one in Christ. And then a key phrase, Christ is all and in all. So as we wrap up this part of Colossians chapter 3, we've got this idea that if you want to be a follower of Jesus, leave behind anything that's harmful or hurts the earth or any single one of its inhabitants and put on love, compassion, kindness, peace, patience, forgiveness, humility and meekness. And then in wrapping it up, the author says, and if you want to know what it looks like if you're living your life in this way, what your relationships look like, what your community looks like, hopefully what your world looks like, it will be a place of peace and gratitude and wisdom and I think my favorite, lots and lots and lots of music. And I'm hoping dancing too. It's this idea that if we fully embrace this vision of God through Jesus, we will honor every part of this earth, including all of its inhabitants, and we won't ever intentionally hurt any part of the earth or any other person. 
And then at the final words in Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God, giving thanks to Jesus our Lord. And the idea here is when you do those things that I just talked about, that's exactly how you give glory to God. When you live your life in such a way that you love and honor all that God loves and honors, which for us, as far as we can see with our eyes, is this earth and all of the earth's inhabitants. So as you think about what it's like to clothe yourself with Christ, I leave you with those words. What would it be like for you to love the earth and all of its inhabitants so much so that when people look at you, that's what they see? Thank you. It's now time for the sharing of joys and concerns. Looks like we've got a card or two. Couple of cards. Thank you, Joanne. And this is a prayer request from Melissa Gregory. James, a restorer at Habitat for Humanity, is looking for a one bedroom studio and one bath to live by September 1st so he doesn't become houseless. He's a great uh, handyman and pool cleaner. And also um, from Melissa, Mahalo Parade Walkers. Um, all the leftover florals have been reserved for the walkers. Please grab from the back patio. So if anybody would just like to take some beautiful tropical florals home with you, we have them back there. And I was actually just going to say um, one of my joys is, was just yesterday, being together and celebrating the day before, decorating, and just kind of being um, a very colorful and fun presence in our community. So the, the rest of our prayer requests are on page seven. And um, I would invite you to just take a look at those as you pray for all of our loved ones and, and those we know that um, need our prayers. And also, if you would like to add anybody at all for our ongoing prayers during the week, um, please let us know by either filling out a prayer card or contacting the church office so that we can add your prayers here. As we pray together now, let us in silence lift up all of our joys and concerns to God. And after a moment of silence, I'll lead us in a public prayer. Let us pray together. Our gracious God, I thank you for each person here today. I thank you also for all the people who participated in yesterday's parade in one way or another. Thank you for the witness of this church. Thank you that we are a church that's open and affirming and a church that is passionate about sharing your love with others. Oh God, as we Consider people like James who are homeless or soon to be homeless. We pray for not only immediate housing for those who need it now, but also for answers to some of our deep problems on this island with a high cost of housing and high cost of living. God, we pray that all those who ought to be here, that you would find a way for them to remain. And God, we also pray for all those among us and those we love who are suffering from injury and illness. We pray for their healing, for comfort and peace. We also pray for those on this island that are suffering from mental illness, those with extreme anxiety and depression, and we ask, oh God, for their healing. And God, as we think about our nation, we continue to ask for your peace for open and honest dialogue. We also pray for healing among all the people who are suffering from the pandemic. We pray again for our president who was tested positive and then better and tested positive again over the weekend. 
God, we pray for all those who are suffering from the pandemic, both physically as well as emotionally, in terms of their jobs, in terms of their social life. God, we know that the world is so different than it was just two and a half years ago. And we pray that you would lead us into being your peace and your presence in this world today. Even though the world may never be quite the same as it was before, we know that you continue to show up in our lives, in our families, and in our communities with love. And so may we clothe ourselves with that love. May we clothe every part of ourselves, and when people look at us, that's what they will see. And God, we know that there are others in our congregation that continue to grieve over loss, including the loss of loved ones, and we pray that you would comfort them as well. Oh God, as we look forward to the week to come, we have no idea what you have in store for us. But we do know that as we learned in the letter to the Colossians today, that the fullness of God is within Christ and Christ is within us. And so we go out into the world and look forward to this week, knowing that the fullness of God is within us and all around us and that there's not a single place that we can go where you are not, where your love is not, and where your peace is not available. And so, God, open our eyes and our hearts to fully embrace your love and your presence. Amen. Hello again, everyone. Uh, this next song, just as we were, or as I was hearing the message this morning, I was thinking about my mom, and um, she's, a, she's a praying woman. She's pretty much pray, gotten up every morning and journaled and read her Bible and, and prayed um, every morning for us and for a lot of, a lot of people. And um, I was just thinking about how she used to sing this song in the morning and sometimes I would hear her and, and uh, it would be, it was a song that was about new mercies every morning and um, every day. And um, I was thinking back to particularly challenging period in my life where I would wake up and I would just be laying in bed and the first thing that I would do is I would pray and, and talk to God and just thank him for, for my life and also ask, ask him to help me with my challenges. And um, I'm in a much better place now, but I notice when I wake up in the morning, I'm still praying, but instead um, I'm just grateful for his presence in my life and his mercies every day. And so um, one of the messages they were talking about was steadfast love. And I take um, a lot of comfort in the fact that no matter what, um, there is a, a God above who loves us and um, regards us and is there for us constantly. Um, and I think my mom knew that well, but I think I'm still learning that lesson. So anyway, hopefully, what I'm saying ties into this next song that we're going to sing. <laughs>
you. Thank you so much. Chris and Michelle, um, let's see here. That, I just wanted to say that's one of my favorite songs and I'm so glad Doug figured out the sound because I was about to ask you to start all over again <laughs> and to sing it. We, we, we got the gist of it and I, I really appreciate you guys. Uh, it's now time to put our face masks back on. Fully cover nose and mouth, please. And we do ask people to keep your face mask on until you're either fully off the property or back in your vehicle. However, I do know that we do uh, we have Ho'okipa over in Moore Hall, and so keep your face mask on until Rose Tatiana tells you can take it off if you're gonna go over there. And then I understand that there is a youth leaders meeting today, and I believe that's gonna either be in my office or here, I, right, right over here somewhere, I guess. So anyway, I see people pointing. Um, so if you are one of the youth leaders that uh, is going to be at today's meeting, just hang out. I guess we'll start in about 10 minutes or so. Um, but before the benediction, I just wanted to say how happy I am and just honored and pleased that this church has hired a new youth director and she has been um, gathering people together that are committing to be youth leaders over the next several months. And today's our first um, gathering together just to meet and talk about what we want to provide for the youth. Um, hold on a second. What we want to, I'm going to just go over here, I think. <laughs> what, what we want to provide for the youth in our church and community. So anyway, um, We'll meet over here somewhere. And now, would you please stand for the benediction? May the love of God, the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the comfort and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and with all people now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. This little light of mine I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, hide it under a bush of no. I'm going to let it shine, hide it under a bush of Let it shine.